Okay. All right. And everyone can see my shared screen right now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, welcome everybody to the virtual Ollie Brown Bag lunch presentation. Uh, we got a really exciting topic for today. So today's topic discussion will be protecting Humboldt Bay past, present and future with Jennifer Kalt, director and Humboldt Bay keeper. So thank you for joining us today. And some little housekeeping. Uh, so when you're not talking while the presenter is talking, please mute yourself. Uh, if you wanted a comment or a question or just wanted to raise your hand uh, to be called on, you can see over here, there's a toolbar on your Zoom screen. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and click raise your hand if you want a reaction, react. Uh, but keep your questions until, uh, oops, until Jennifer calls on you or until there's like a space. And here at Ollie, we believe that learning should never end. And uh, right now we acknowledge that Cal Poly Humboldt is on the land of the Wiat peoples, which includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and the Blue Lake Rancheria. Arcata is known as Gudini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. Wiat peoples continue to remain in relationship to these lands through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. Knowing the history of this area is important and we value lifelong learning. Uh, real quick about membership, we wanted to thank everybody who's joining us this summer. All is a membership-based program and membership runs from July 1st through June 30th. Membership must be renewed each year for student to remain active. Primary membership for people 50 and better is 35 annually. And you can kind of see right here how uh, the numbers kind of are, we're trying to recover after COVID. So I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, you should register and join. Um, all eight classes are designed for lifelong learners 50 and better. Classes are open to all learners over age 18. Non-members pay an additional charge and are enrolled as space allows. And so this summer 2022, there's still some classes open. Um, so we hope that you will agree that this summer, Ollie at Humboldt has an impressive lineup of classes. We're offering more opportunities to connect with Ollie in person this year, with classes being offered in an outdoor learning center, as well as campus classrooms and across the country. There will be more classes being announced for this upcoming fall, so stay tuned for that. And for everybody who's interested, uh, you have one more day. Tomorrow is the last day to register for Ollie Back to Camp. Uh, the first week of August, Ollie will be hosting an opportunity to camp at the Wolf Creek Education Center in a beautiful Redwood Park setting. Uh, Register July 12th. July 12th, that was the open house that was last week, so don't worry about that. But tomorrow, Tuesday the 26th, is the last day to register, so keep your eyes on that. Question. Yes. Is that the last day to register for the half day or one day classes or just for the entire camp? I think it's for the, the full happy camper for the full five days. Um, I so can, if you want to, if you want to register for a half a day class or a whole day, you can do that still, I presume. I believe so. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oop. And you need to go online um, to see the times and dates of those classes. So that and, and transportation is included as part of that. <clears throat> so if yes. you want to go up, say for the Tuesday morning classes and come back after the morning or go for the afternoon classes, including dinner, you can do that. Um, so, uh, but go online if you're interested in doing that. And that's where you'll see the time and uh, opportunities for that. Okay. Uh -huh. And on that note, uh, there's deadlines for classes. So we encourage students to sign up for classes as soon as possible, but not later than three days before the class begins its start date. Classes with a low enrollment are at risk of being canceled and early enrollment helps faculty prepare for the courses. Registration forms are accepted and pro processed until 4 p.m. during all business hours. And we wanted to thank everybody, all you friends of Ollie out there. Our program would not be possible without your wonderful support. 
And a little quick announcement, library is now open for all the members. When coming on Cal Poly Humboldt campus, you may be asked to show your student ID card. Uh, essentially, what it comes down to, if you are an OLLI member and are enrolled, you have the same permissions and access to the Cal Poly Humboldt Library as regular fully time, fully enrolled students. So that's a cool little, little thing we got going on. Oops. And if you wanted to have uh, or enroll in a scholarship for OLLI classes, a lot of those are covered, made possible because of the generosity of the friends at OLLI. So once again, thank you, friends of OLLI. All OLLI members are eligible to apply for scholarship funds. And if you want to apply, OLLI members may submit an OLLI scholarship request form, which is found on our website. Scholarships may only apply to course fees and not to OLLI memberships, so just for the classes. And based on financial need, and they're limited to scholarships per term. And thank you to all the OLLI volunteers. We really appreciate all your support and, and our operations here would not be possible without that wonderful support. So thank you to all the Ollie volunteers. And I'm going to turn it over to Jane, who is going to announce and bring up our presenter. And I'm delighted to welcome you all today. And we are privileged to have Jennifer Kalt here today, who is director of Humboldt Baykeeper, which is a nonprofit organization that works to protect Humboldt Bay's water quality and habitat for human health, as well as wildlife, and of course, our oysters. <laughs> From 2001 to 2010, she worked on behalf of California Indian basket weavers to protect native plants and drinking water supplies from forestry herbicides, which combined her passion for conservation with environmental justice issues. She is also a member of the Humboldt Sea Level Rise Institute and a lecturer at Cal Poly Humboldt's Department of Environmental Science and Management. Welcome, Jennifer, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Jane, and thank you everybody for coming. Um, I see a lot of people I know, including, I see Aldrum Laird is here, um, and my old neighbor, Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Um, so I do want to say before I get started that if you have a question, feel free to just unmute yourself because I'll never be able to see hands up with this many people here. Um, I have about a half hour presentation with slides and then figured I'd leave the rest of the time for a discussion, questions, whatever people want to talk about, because I just wasn't sure what, um, what everyone would be most interested in, okay? Uh, but feel free to ask questions as I go on. Um, I'm share my screen. And not that, but this. Um, I need to get on present view, but my Zoom thing is in the way here. Hold on. Okay, there we go. All right. So uh, my name is Jen. Um, I'm the director of Humble Baykeeper, and I have been with the organization off uh, for many, many years since the very beginning as a consultant, but I've been the director since 2014. Um, and um, so I thought I would start off just giving you a little bit of an overview of what Humboldt Baykeeper does. Um, our mission is to protect Humboldt Bay and um, our mission includes not just protecting the bay for environmental health, but also human health uh, because so many people rely on the bay for fishing, for uh, harvesting oysters and clams and other other critters to eat, but also for swimming and recreation. And it's a really important um, part of not only our economy in the Humboldt Bay area, but the culture of the Humboldt Bay area. There's so many people who live within sight of Humboldt Bay that it's, you know, it's one of the um, most important features of our, of our community. Um, Diane Ryerson's here. So our program areas basically focus on bay tours, getting people out on the water, uh, water quality. So we do a lot of sampling um, for stormwater pollution and that sort of thing. And then we also focus a lot on toxics. And this is um, 
a lot of what I'll talk about today is the Toxics Initiative, our current work um, around contaminated sites and sea level rise around Humboldt Bay. Um, I, I uh, um, want to talk a little bit about our Bay Tours program because these are not public tours anymore. You know, many of you may know we used to have uh, lots of public tours, but what we do now is we focus entirely on underserved groups. And so we get grant money to offer free tours for people with um, the Matica and also the Humboldt Bay Aquatic Center, which is thankfully back in action since uh, a little COVID hiatus. And so um, it's great because we can get people kayaking on the bay who've never been on the water before. And, you know, um, we started doing this in part because we had so many people who would come to our coastal cleanups and say, you know, I've lived here my whole life and I've never kayaked on Humboldt Bay before. So it's just not that accessible to a lot of people. And then when they get out on the bay, they realize it's actually very accessible if you want to rent kayaks from the Humboldt Bay Aquatic Center. Um, by the hour, you can do that. Um, so we do coastal cleanups twice a year, typically. We have uh, had a little hiatus on that because of COVID, of course, but we work with the Wiat tribe to clean up trash that washes up on Indian Island, or um, now it is called Tulawat Island, or Tulawat. Um, oftentimes that stuff is all blowing off the Samoa bridges as well, but it's a great way to get people out on the water and also do some good for the environment and explore a part of the bay that very few people have a chance to explore. Um, Tulawat is really incredible. Um, we have done um, testing of mercury levels in fish and we have this guideline that um, is really helpful. It's on our website. Um, it's really helpful because there are a lot of fish and shellfish in our region that are very low in mercury. And so you'll see here, for example, um, Chinook salmon is safe for women and children to eat five to seven servings a week, which is um, Yurok subsistence level consumption. And then down here, you will see the highest mercury levels are fish to avoid. So this is really important for women of childbearing age, that's women under 45 approximately, uh, and children because of the um, detrimental effects of mercury on children and fetuses. So check that out. If you eat a lot of fish or know people who do, it's really helpful because it's a local guideline, not, not uh, you know, generalized for the, for the rest of the country. Um, a lot of what we work on is bacteria pollution, and you may have heard in the news recently, Moonstone Beach was designated the sixth most polluted beach in California. And uh, this beach report card comes out every year, and it's based entirely on bacteria pollution. And so this is um, fecal bacteria that uh, we've been studying using genetic analyses um, for quite a few years, and these are cows up on the Little River, and they are the primary source of the bacteria pollution at Moonstone Beach. And um, so um, the, the short version of what to do about this is to avoid uh, swimming or bringing little kids, especially to Little River for 72 hours after a major rainstorm, because after that, the bacteria die. They can't survive outside the guts of warm-blooded animals. And so this is a, a problem that is ubiquitous all over the world. Stormwater pollution just runs off, um, you know, pavement and roofs and all kinds of things, cow pastures and it gets into the waterway. So wherever you are in the world, um, it's good to avoid exposure to stormwater after a big rainstorm. And then a lot of our work is um, focused on contaminated sites, which I'll talk about later in more detail, but basically there are a lot of low-lying contaminated sites from the industrial past. Um, some of them are current, um, you know, lumber mills that are still operating, but many of them were built long, long ago on wetland fill. And so they are very low lying. And as you can see here in this image, this is one of our mapping projects where 
we have um, the, the various known contaminated sites near the Arcata Marsh. This is Butcher's Slough, the mouth of Butcher's Slough here. And uh, this is McDaniel Slough. And these are sea level rise projections. And so this has been the focus of quite a bit of our um, work lately. And, and uh, what we do is um, we do a lot of historical research into the sites, what chemicals were used there, what sorts of cleanups have been done. And then we also watchdog development. So any kind of um, development that is proposed for one of these contaminated sites, if there's going to be ground disturbance, um, we, we comment on those plans to make sure that people aren't unknowingly remobilizing contamination because that can happen. Um, I just wanted to show this um, sort of the, the uh, layout of Humboldt Bay as three separate um, little mini bays, I guess you might call them. People call North Bay Arcata Bay. And this is um, you know, what a lot of us in Arcata are, are used to seeing and walking around. And it's you know, lots of beautiful views, lots of protected space. And then Entrance Bay in Eureka is where there's a lot more heavy industry. Um, and then South Bay is mostly National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so before I get into, um, oh, uh, so, and the, these are the four sub watersheds of Humboldt Bay. So Humboldt Bay drains approximately 250 square miles. And so you have Salmon Creek, Elk River, Freshwater Creek, and Jacoby Creek are the major tributaries that flow into the bay. So it's a rather large bay, second largest estuary in California, but it drains a fairly small area, especially you know, compared to San Francisco Bay. Um, as the um, uh, person talked about in the introduction, we are on Wiat tribal ancestral territory here in the Humboldt Bay area. Um, and Tulawat is the center of the universe for the Wiat tribe. And uh, they call Humboldt Bay Wigi. Uh, so here's a picture that Aldron took during an extreme high tide, which we call King Tides of Tulawat. And uh, you can see that much of the island was submerged during this very high tide. <clears throat> So I just want to show some pretty pictures, tour around the bay before I get into uh, talking about some of the issues that we work on. Um, so North Bay, as you know, there is a lot of incredible dunes on the North Spit. This is Moel Dunes on the left. And much of North Bay is used for oyster farms, lots of fishing, um, recreational hunting, and then also lots of kayaking here. This is a, a picture a friend took of his kid with this uh, SPI mill in the background. So there is some industry in North Bay, but um, it's, it's largely um, used for oyster cultivation. So on the left, you can see the oysters growing on what are called long lines. And those are elevated above the bay mud uh, but that's not how they used to be grown. On the right, you can see the scars that still remain from when the oysters were grown on the bay floor, just right down in the mud. And then the oyster farmers would use something like a vacuum to just suck up all the oysters out of the mud. And they would leave these huge scars and destroy all the eelgrass in those areas. Uh, so these are still visible from aerial photos or from an airplane, even though they stopped doing this in the late 1990s. They're all grown either like this or in baskets now so that the eelgrass can grow underneath those lines. Um, so Entrance Bay, as I said, it has a lot more heavy industry. And a lot of times, if you have not been out on the Matakit, um, I highly recommend it. But a lot of times we take people out on the Matakit and they're just astounded at how much industry there is around the bay because it's a lot more visible from the water than it is from the shore. Um, so on the left, this is obviously the pulp mill when it was still cranking out pulp. And then... Um, 
On the right, these are the fuel tanks where all the Chevron fuel comes in on a barge from the San Francisco Bay Area and then is stored in these tanks that were built, I think, in the 1940s, maybe even earlier. And as you can see, they're pretty close to the current sea level. And uh, this is one of the major infrastructure um, questions. What are we going to do about this? Because most of our gasoline and diesel that's consumed in, in the Humboldt Bay area comes in through the Chevron barges and is stored in these tanks and then trucked out to gas stations. Um, so we better come up with a plan for that. Um, so South Bay, this on the right is a view from the um, Table Bluff near where the Weat Reservation is looking across at South Bay. Uh, you can see the pulp mill right there. Um, but South Bay is primarily Humboldt Bay National Wildlife Refuge, and it just has huge expanses of eelgrass. And um, I think Humboldt Bay has something like 40% of the eelgrass remaining in the whole state of California. Um, so lots of wildlife down there. There's hunting and recreation, but not a lot of human um, disturbance in terms of like development and that sort of, you know, polluted runoff and stuff. Although there are industrial timberlands in that part of the watershed. Um, so I put this slide together um, just to give you a kind of quick overview of Humboldt Bay's size, 16,000 acres, although it was much bigger at one time before the dikes were all built. Um, it's, it's really um, an unusual bay or estuary because of all the exposed mud flats. So, you know, if you think about the area between low tide and high tide in a place like San Francisco Bay, it's a pretty small area. But here in Humboldt Bay, it's, you know, ten, it's thousands and thousands of acres that get exposed every day during low tide. Um, there are fringes of salt marsh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the salt marsh and what happened to the salt marsh over time. But um, I listed here some of the major issues that Humboldt Bay focuses that um, I, I either have talked about or will talk about. Um, so I, I titled my talk, uh, Humboldt Bay Past, Present and Future in part because a lot of the work that we do at Humboldt Baykeeper is dealing with the legacy of the past. And so a lot of the, the land use activities, a lot of the decisions that were made in the past um, had tremendous changes, um, made tremendous changes to Humboldt Bay and its watershed. And, and so a lot of what we're dealing with is really a lot of the legacy of that um, industrial past. So here in this photo, um, you can see the smoke from all the conical burners that were uh, burning wood waste at the mills. So there were over 100 logging uh, lumber mills around Humboldt Bay at one time. And people who lived here before the Clean Air Act was adopted in the early 70s talk about how you couldn't hang laundry out to dry or you would have to use a squeegee to, to clean off your windshield on your car before at the end of one day, just one day, it would get covered in ash from sitting outside. Um, so this must have been, you know, it, it must have been pretty wild to live here when there was that much wood smoke being burned all the time. Um, a really fascinating um, part of the history of Humboldt Bay Area is whaling. Um, talk about resource extraction. The, the whaling industry um, harvested thousands of whales here. And this is a picture of uh, Trinidad. Um, this is the little Trinidad head on the right. And this ramp is uh, the, uh, the ramp, they would pull the dead whales up to the whaling, um, whale processing facility. So this is that bluff above the Seascape restaurant, if you know, the trail to Trinidad Head, you can look, stand on this bluff and look down at the beach. But this ramp was built um, in 1920. There was a, a whaling station there just from 1920 to 1926, they killed over 1,100 whales in Trinidad. 
And then um, there was a, a whaling station at Fields Landing that was the last one operating in the continental US. And I think it was operating until the early 1950s. So pretty wild. Um, earlier than that, even there was railroad construction. And so we see a lot of the remnants of the railroad around the bay today, cutting off the, the tide from what was salt marsh at one time. And so we're still, still dealing with a lot of the legacy of the railroads that were built around the bay. Um, the, the one um, major change that I wanna talk about more in depth is the dike and levee construction around Humboldt Bay, uh, because that has led to um, so much of the area being vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, so, you know, in the 19th century, basically, um, all these earthen dikes were built around the bay out of bay mud. And in some cases, they're, um, they're eroding because they're not really being maintained. Um, but the idea was to cut off the tidal influence from these areas behind the dikes and turn them into pastures. So what that did was it eliminated about 90% of the salt marshes around Humboldt Bay. So this is a map showing the original extent in Tan. Uh, there were originally 9,000 acres of salt marsh around Humboldt Bay, and today there's only about 900 acres. Um, so the salt marshes, you know, they're not only are they a really important habitat for all kinds of flora and fauna, but they also filter a lot of uh, runoff to, to the bay. And so, um, Restoring a lot of that habitat has been the focus of really big projects like the McDaniel Slough Project in Arcata and the city of Eureka is doing one uh, at the Elk River Estuary right now. They're just, just launching uh, that project this summer. Um, so here's some pictures of restored salt marsh on the left with um, Humboldt Bay Owl's Clover, the amazing fluorescent pink flowers that grow in the salt marsh. And then on the right, this is uh, near Lanfair Dunes. Um, they're really incredible, beautiful places, but unfortunately, people in the past viewed them as um, wastelands to uh, quote unquote reclaim. And so what they did is they converted a lot of these areas into um, farmland. Apparently the wheat harvest that's happening in this picture wasn't, I, I don't know when people stopped growing wheat and potatoes around Humboldt Bay, but they seem to have tried that for a while and then cattle became the dominant use of these agricultural or farmed wetlands. Um, but, you know, before the dikes, these would have all been salt marshes. And so what you see if you're out on top of some of these dikes, these are two great photos that Aldron took um, that were in a North Coast Journal article. Um, in this one on the left, you can see that the diked and drained pastures uh, on the right are lower in elevation than the, than the water level on the left. And so what happens is if those dikes breach, all that water just rushes in and floods those farm fields. Um, so that happens sometimes and will be happening probably increasingly as sea level rises. So um, about 10 years ago, we launched the King Tides Photo Initiative to get people um, to be thinking about what sea level rise will mean for our region because the highest tides of the year are about a foot higher than the average high tide. And so, you know, this, this might be what an average high tide looks like with one foot of sea level rise. Um, so when we started doing this, um, there was this little tiny hole in the railroad dike here by Braycut. If you know where that is, you can see this. Um, it's a pretty big hole under the railroad now because that railroad dike is not being maintained. So um, on the left was in 2015 and on the right was just five years later. You can see the water is coming pretty close to the, the roadway um, on the Highway 101 corridor. So this is an area that's really vulnerable to sea level rise and all that's really protecting the highway right now is this old railroad dike that isn't being maintained. Um, 
although hopefully this will be the Humboldt Bay Trail next year and there will be so, uh, no more hole in the, in the dike there. Um, so a lot of Alderon's work has focused on these um, diked former tidelands that are at risk from sea level rise and all the different um, infrastructure, the roads, the sewer plants and sewer transmission lines, all the, all the things that are at risk um, as sea level rises. And you know, we really need to plan for what to do about all that public infrastructure. Um, you can see in this image, the Arcata Wastewater Treatment Plant is very vulnerable. So is the Eureka Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, and so, you know, these, these things take years and years to plan. And so um, we need to start planning to relocate these, but it's, it's difficult, expensive, um, controversial. And so, um, you know, it's, it's been slow going, <laughs> it's fair to say. Anybody have any questions before I keep going? Okay. Uh, so back to the contaminated sites. Um, this has been a major focus for Humboldt Baykeeper since the organization was founded in 2004. And the main contamination um, that we focus on is dioxins. And the dioxins are uh, from a wood preservative called pentachlorophenol that was banned in the 1980s because of the dioxin content in, in the preservatives. So dioxins um, are very toxic, very long-lived chemicals. There are um, a whole bunch of different kinds of dioxins, but there are the the same compounds that are in Agent Orange that um, have so has you know caused so many health problems in, in people in this in South Asia from aerial spraying of Agent Orange. In the Humboldt Bay area, they were used at these mill sites and they're still present in a lot of these uh, low-lying areas, which were built on top of wetlands. So they're they're you know in wetland fill and very vulnerable to rising sea level. So a lot of what we do is research these sites. And this is a site in Blue Lake. You can see on the left in 1951, this was a lumber mill. The railroad track is this sort of curved arc here that you can see in the, in the image here as like a strip of forest. But um, in the image, you can see this lumber mill. Here's the conical burner. Uh, and they were using pentachlorophenol here. And in this image, you can't see anything remaining except maybe the, the outline of the foundations of some of those buildings. Uh, so we discovered um, that a, a cannabis entrepreneur was, uh, had bought this property and was planning on building a, a factory to extract cannabis oil. Um, and you know, a lot of people figure, well, it's an industrial site, so why not? But the the problem here is it's right next to the Mad River and Hall Creek, which is a, a coho bearing stream. And it's just upriver from our drinking water supplies. And so the idea of getting in here and stirring all the soil up without um, identifying the extent of contamination and cleaning it up is, is really um, concerning for the, the river and for our drinking water resources. And, you know, every, all the other critters that rely on the river. So a lot of what we do is comment on these sorts of plans and insist on characterizing and cleaning up those sites. Um, Was that plan stopped? Um, it's, it's in limbo right now because the, the owners have entered into an agreement with the State Department of Toxic Substance Control to uh, sample and and hopefully clean up the contamination. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a good thing that it didn't go forward because of this was this site and the McNamara and Peep site, which is across the street, uh, had a huge spill in of Penta in 1968 that killed 10,000 steelhead in the Mad River just in one week. 
And so we know that this area is probably very contaminated, but those buildings were all removed in the 1970s and, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, Everybody so, forgets. <laughs> yeah. We do have a question uh, from Kate Hitt uh, about if the bay was always so shallow or if it got more shallow because they were taking mud from it to create the dikes. Or I don't know the answer to that. Deeper, if it got deeper because of taking mud for, to build the dikes. I don't know the answer to that, but um, I do know that a lot of sediment has run off uh, into the bay from the timberlands, um, you know, over the past century or so. And um, I don't know, does anyone else, has anyone else heard that the bay used to be deeper before all this heavy industry? And maybe Aldron has heard about that. I, I have not. I, my there used to be navigation channels that came all the way up to Arcata. Remember, they had that wharf way out off the shoreline. Oh, so yeah. Boats had to be able to get all the way there, and they had barges that would come from Jacoby Creek all the way up to that reach. I don't know if those navigation channels are actually shallower than what they were in the, the 1800s and early 1900s when they were used, though. But I don't think it's changed much. I don't think there's been a in, huge influx in sediment. We've always looked at the pasture lands and wondered how on earth, where they got all the dirt to fill those, <laughs> or is that just what was the bottom of the bay at one point? Yeah, that was where the salt marsh was and all the salt marsh vegetation died and uh, the ground compacted and uh, they just plowed it up and, and started raising crops on it. No, so they didn't bring in fill from anywhere. No. No. There are a few exceptions, like where the California Redwood Company mill is here. Um, that was basically dredge material and also part of a hill called Brainerd's Cut. There was a hill over here and they just, oh, maybe that was up here and they dumped it in the Bay at Bray Cut. So both of these are, are fill that was brought in from somewhere. Um, it's really wild. There used to be a really big hill right next to the bay and it just got carved out and dumped into the bay. Um, a lot of work. Um, here's yeah. those navigational. Jen, mm -hmm. um, when I was teaching high school in Arcadia in the late 60s, I guess it was, I attended a symposium on the bay. And if I remember correctly, um, they said that the Mad River used to empty into the um, the North Bay. It came through the lowlands there. Um, and now the outfall has changed and it no longer does that. And we're considered an old bay and we don't have the uh, volume of water to flush it out like it used to. So over the years it has built up, you know, the last couple of hundred years. And that's why it got shallower. And if I remember correctly, that's why Arcata lost their wharfing uh, ability because it filled in so much. But that's mm -hmm. been many years ago that I <laughs> attended that. So my um, memories may not be um, all that accurate. Well, that may be why this was called Mad River Slough, it seems. Kind of odd. I know that Mad River used to um, discharge into the ocean right at the end of School Road just in the 1940s. So the mouth of that river has changed a lot and it may change again with rising sea level. Yeah. Um, so this is a map just showing you all, uh, all the known contaminated sites around the bay. They're not all lumber mills, but they mostly were lumber mills at one time or still are. Um, so we're in the process of um, mapping all of the sites that, that we know about um, and then also mapping the rising groundwater projections. Um, so as sea level rises, there's this issue of flooding and eroding the shoreline, but there's also rising groundwater. So, you know, a lot of times people think, well, we can just build seawalls and keep the sea out or keep the bay out. 
But the problem with that is um, not only, you know, when it rains, where's the stormwater going to go? If you're trying to block the seawater out, you're also blocking the, the stormwater from going out as it rains. But also the groundwater rises as sea level rises. And so this is becoming a much more um, recognized problem, uh, particularly in places like San Francisco Bay, um, where there are just, you know, hundreds of contaminated sites all around the bay, also in former wetlands, so lots of low-lying areas. Um, and as the groundwater rises, it can push contaminated groundwater off-site. And so there's the potential, especially when you have groundwater that's rising and falling, it can be coming into contact with contaminated soil, so basically flooding from below instead of from above the ground. And um, so we have a California Environmental Protection Agency grant to map the contaminated sites and um, uh, the projections for rising sea level and rising groundwater. And the idea is to prioritize which sites are most vulnerable and target them for cleanup. Uh, you know, some of the some of these sites have taken years and years to get fully cleaned up. And so uh, we need to start now. Um, so who does that work? The cleanups? Yeah. Oh, uh, lots of different consultants do the cleanup work. Um, it depends, you know, SHN is one of the consultants around here that does the, the cleanups. There's um, a company called Tetra Tech that does all the consulting with the US EPA where we have, um, there's four sites in Arcata that we worked with the city of Arcata to apply for grant funding from the US EPA to clean up. And they're, they're right now assessing those four sites. Um, although one of them is pretty close to clean up, I think, which is the, the old Arcata Volunteer Fire Department site on M Street by Bug Press, because they've done a lot of sampling there already. Um, but, um, so, you know, consultants who have geologists and engineers and hydrologists on staff do that type of work. Do they actually come in and bulldoze the soil that they find contaminated and haul it off somewhere, or what do they do? Sometimes they do that, yeah. Um, there's uh, hazardous waste facilities that will accept that material. Um, sometimes there can be on-site remediation by injecting some kind of chemicals and waiting for the, the, the chemicals to break down the contamination. It depends on what kind of contamination it is, like a dry cleaner site, for example, would be different than a dioxin site. Can you chemically uh, wipe out dioxin? Uh, dioxin is a, is a more difficult one to... Um, bioremediate, um, but especially when it's in the bay mud because there's no oxygen to um, get those processes going. And so that's a, that's a more difficult situation. Although I recently met with the, some folks from the Port of San Diego that have a pilot study with a company who invented a method of absorbing PCBs and dioxins from the bay mud. So they're doing a pilot study in San Diego that sounds fairly promising. Um, you basically inject these um, cone-shaped spears into the mud and let them sit and they have something inside of them that absorbs the dioxins and PCBs. So that's hopeful. Uh, because here you see in this in red, in dark red here around the mouth of Butcher Slough and uh, you know, around Clop Lake and the wastewater treatment plant, this is a big dioxin hotspot where a lot of the sediment was deposited from these various mills along Jolly Giant Creek. Um, and so, you know, the first step is to try to clean up these sites. There's one not shown here where the cursor is. This was a lumber mill and there was a plywood mill right where the Arcata Marsh Interpretive Center is today. So the US EPA is characterizing or sampling that area to try and determine how, you know, where the contamination is and how best to clean it up. 
And then this um, sort of triangular shape in red, that's the Little Lake Industries property that um, is on South I Street and uh, so on up the up the creek, you know, they put a lot of these lumber mills in these former wetlands and riparian areas. So all that contaminated sediment has been flowing down Butcher's Slough and being deposited here over the years. So what is the one that's further up? Where is that? That's at the top of the picture. This is that one, the existing little lumber mill that's still there. Uh, this one is the read and write mill that's been partially redeveloped with housing. Um, there's a, um, I don't know what it is exactly. It's like a, a lumber storage yard and they, and they, it's not really a lumber mill. Um, but most of that mill has been redeveloped now. Um, is that in the gateway area? Um, I think it, I think it is because, um, Alliance is up here. Um, I'm not sure if that is in the gateway area. My, the gateway area might end in the middle of that. Because um, I know there's a lumber facility up there in the gateway area. Oh yeah, well, there's one right here called Beaver Lumber. And that's another one that the US EPA um, is characterizing right now. <clears throat> and that one, that one is our one of our biggest priorities to clean up because of the, the um, risk from sea level rise and rising groundwater. Who is actually responsible? for making these projects happen? I mean, who's in charge of them? Which projects, the cleanups? The cleanups, yeah. Is it the um, city, well, is it the county, who is it? It depends on who owns the property. Oh, okay. And it depends on if the, what we call the responsible party, the, the company that was responsible for the contamination still exists or not. A lot of them are bankrupt and so there is no responsible party. So whoever owns the land today is generally responsible or the state may have responsibility for it. Just like with the pulp mill, you know, the pulp mill uh, went bankrupt and the owners left the country um, and uh, the responsibility for cleaning that site up falls to the public, to the taxpayers. So the areas around the lakes uh, that you show toward the bottom here, um, what's being done with those? Do you know? Uh, this, the areas of contamination yeah. in the bay mud. Yeah. Nothing is being done with that right now. Um, what we're focusing on is trying to figure out the source of dioxin up here, here, here and not so much here, but right here. This is the volunteer fire department site. Or is it? I think that might be over here. Um, so trying to figure out what the source is and trying to stop the source. Sure. Um, So um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the future. So we know there are a lot of really big projects. Well, not a lot. There are a few massive projects being proposed. And the biggest one that I think is, is going to have some major changes in the Humboldt Bay area is the offshore wind energy project. Um, and I say it's going to have big, big changes to the, make big changes to the Humboldt Bay area because the wind terminal site in Samoa um, is going to be um, a huge change. So here on the left, you see in 1951, this was Hammond Lumber Company. So this was one of the biggest mills in the county in the 1950s and, and 60s. Um, I believe it closed down sometime in the 70s. And this is what it looks like today. So this is a lot of what we deal with is looking at these old Schuster photos that are online in the Humboldt State um, archive room of the library. And 
seeing what used to be there and um you know because when you look at what the site is today it's hard to really see um what areas might have been contaminated where the different activities were going on so the harbor district owns the site and it's called redwood marine terminal one and you can see this is the dock it's this old dilapidated dock that's falling apart and you can see it in this image here um, so right now the Harbor District is doing the characterization to try and identify, you know, the, the extent of contamination with the Harbor District or with the US EPA so they can clean that site up. But then they also need to raise the elevation quite a bit because of sea level rise. Um, oh, this didn't come out very well. And in, in, uh, let's see if I can show you without it being too pixelated. This is an artist's rendering of the wind terminal site. So you can see really massive structures. They're taller than the pulp mill. Um, so this will be, you know, a pretty major change on Humboldt Bay, the biggest industrial change to the bay we've seen in a long time. Um, you see, I've gone over my target uh, half hour here, so. Um, just lastly, I wanted to show you uh, the Baykeeper website where you can go for more information. Um, we have a section on the right for news, just general news related to the Bay. And then on the left, we have program areas. So um, we have a section on offshore wind where you can read collected stories about the offshore wind or there's been some good news on billboards recently, the Coastal Commission restricting the number and brightness of digital signs in Eureka. And lastly, Nordic Aqua Farms, which you may know is going to be um, the subject of Planning Commission hearing this Thursday. Um, so that's all I have for you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to Oh, oh, wait, I do have one more thing I wanted to show you. This is our sea level rise, interactive sea level rise projection map that we've been working on. Uh, so these are the um, local sea level rise projections. Um, what's shown here is one meter of sea level rise with a 10 year flood event in dark blue, and then with a hundred year flood event in light blue. And we're working on making this public so that you can easily just zoom into an area and see um, your, your neighborhood or maybe you're interested in the gateway area here is the gateway area approximately like that. So you can see one meter of sea level rise. The, the line right here is the city limits. And so we're we're helping to make this easily accessible for the average person, so that you can you know have a look at the neighborhood that you're interested in, uh, because there's sea level rise projections out there that aren't really easily accessible, or they aren't local projections. They're just sort of generalized. And since we have twice the rate of sea level rise, or the fastest rate on the west coast, it's important to be looking at local sea level rise projections. Um, so. Hopefully we will have that online soon. Is is the bay basically rising or subsiding over time, at least the North Bay? Well, the ground beneath the bay is sinking at about the same rate that sea level is rising. And that's why we have the highest rate of relative sea level rise on the West Coast. North Bay is sinking a little bit less, a little bit more slowly than South Bay. So this relative sea level rise uh, rate is more of a concern the further south towards the triple junction that you go. Uh, so South Bay, um, you know, just north of Eureka, where the Highway 101 corridor is most at risk, and then down by the refuge. Um, if you know where the Hooked and Slough exit um, from 101 is, that area floods a lot where Salmon Creek um, flows towards the bay right there. Have we noticed any uh, significant 
rise or sinking related to any recent earthquakes? I am not qualified to answer that question. <laughs> any geologist in the room? Where's Jay Patton? <laughs> Alderon, are you aware? I'm not aware of that. That'd be kind of interesting to know. Uh, are, do we have any questions in the chat? Um, I don't see any in the chat, um, but if... Oh, um, Kate hit actually asked, how can we get a hold of these contamination and sea level maps? Well, the contamination map is a work in progress. So um, we have a grant, like I said, from California EPA, and that will hopefully be um, finished at the end of next year. Um, and then, um, but you can always ask me if you have any questions about specific areas. And then the sea level rise maps, they are available, but like I said, they're pretty, um, you know, the Humboldt County GIS online, you can access a layer that shows one meter of sea level rise. Um, but we'll, we'll make this um, interactive map available soon and we'll put it on our website. Um, I just, you know, I've been talking with Jeff Anderson, the scientist who to develop the projections to, um, you know, make sure that I have all the information on there that we should have to make it public. And it, it's already public, but it's just not that easy to find. Before we started the talk, we actually were talking about the effectiveness of Arcata's waste treatment system in the ponds and the remediation that's being done or the upgrading and, and its adequacy. How much problem, what is the extent of the problem of the contamination from the outfall pipe, from that going directly into the bay? I mean, do we have a, a, a significant amount of contamination going from Arcata and Eureka, for example, into the bay? And is it affecting our oysters? Both the wastewater treatment plants in Arcata and Eureka have significant violations of their permit terms. So that's a way of saying there is quite a bit of pollution coming from those wastewater treatment plants. They're both very old, not functioning very well. Um, and they're both in the process of, uh, well, the, the Arcata waste sort of treatment plant has already gotten a permit from the Regional Water Board to upgrade that plant. Um, the Coastal Commission has not approved that plan yet, but I, I'm told that will be at the September Coastal Commission hearing. Um, there's a lot of concern about pumping millions of dollars of public funding into these sites that are at risk from sea level rise. So, um, you know, these upgrades aren't considering sea level rise. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if the Coastal Commission, um, you know, uh, my understanding is that they would prefer to see a relocation plan over time. So, you know, instead of waiting until it's an emergency, plan this out. Where are you going to relocate that plan? It's going to take decades to come up with those plans. And a lot of times if we wait for an emergency, you know, people will be scrambling to protect, you know, he, people's lives and property, but the, the environment will suffer. And so, you know, if you can just imagine a, a big high tide coinciding with the major storm that, you know, washes over into the sewage treatment ponds, that could be really disastrous for the bay and for the oyster industry and whatnot. Um, so waiting till it's an emergency is a bad idea, but planning these things can be pretty difficult and very, very expensive. I mean, right now I understood that the stage two permit had the state had sit, stopped that activity at the moment. Is that because the Coastal Commission is uh, still evaluating stage one permit? Oh, the two phases of the upgrade? Yeah, uh, the two phases. I don't know. I'm not really sure why that is and what's going on. You know, there are so many issues. And one thing I think about a lot is how 
the complexity of environmental issues has just grown and grown over the past decades, you know, and each one of these issues is so complex. Um, you know, it could be a full-time job just to follow the, the Arcado wastewater treatment upgrades. So, um, and I'm not an engineer, I'm a botanist by training. So um, wastewater treatment is not my area of expertise to say the least, um, but I try to follow it as best I can. I mean, a lot of times what Humboldt Baykeeper does is we focus on issues where, uh, issues that are falling through the cracks. So if government agencies are doing a very, you know, a lot of due diligence and, you know, the regional water board is, is working on the, on the discharge permits, the coastal commission is working on the sea level rise planning or, you know, all the, all the things that they work on protecting the coastal resources. A lot of times we will focus our attention on issues like that mill in Blue Lake that wasn't getting any government agency's attention. Um, you know, it just slipped through the cracks and part of it is the compartmentalization of all these different agencies. So the, you know, the regional water board focuses on water and the county focuses on development and, you know, so on and so forth. So sometimes things do fall through the cracks in between all those, you know, agencies that don't really overlap all the time. Um, Any I other see, questions? Hmm? I see in the chat, uh, Kay asks about the wind project's effect on dredging. And yes, it will, it will likely have some effects in terms of dredging, uh, but it's, we're not really sure yet. Um, you know, a lot of the offshore wind energy um, development is fairly speculative at this point. There's there's such a limitation on the amount of electricity that can be exported or transmitted out of Humboldt County. Um, there's just so many questions. It's going to be a long time before that really happens, but I think it probably will involve dredging to build all those new port facilities. Um, and then another question, the picture you showed of the projected wind project where the hardware is produced, uh, that, um, that is also unknown to what extent the, the wind turbines would be um, constructed partially somewhere else and then shipped here. Um, but presumably uh, the existing dredging at the entrance and the, and the navigation channel along Samoa would be sufficient for, for that. But I, I don't know that the bay can stand too much more deepening, honestly, but I don't know. All, all really good questions. Um, what about the sea cable, the Pacific cable coming in? Has that had any impact on the bay or is it not going through the bay? No, it is. Um, it, it passes underneath Mad River Slough near the SPI mill. And that was one of those issues that fell in between the cracks between government agencies. And the Coastal Commission was the only one that caught the fact that they were going to be drilling through contaminated soil because I called and asked them, you know, are you working with the Regional Water Board on this issue? And they said no. Um, because the regional water board just didn't, didn't, you know, it was a series of what we call categorical exemptions from environmental review. Uh, so because the cable was buried next to a road, it was in the Caltrans or county road easement. And so uh, it was given an exemption, no environmental review necessary. Um, so anyway, thankfully, the Coastal Commission oftentimes is the backstop on a lot of these things that won't get looked at by other agencies or um, that other agencies don't want to look at in some cases. So um, the Coastal Commission is really um, oftentimes our, our, our best chance of protecting the bay and coastal resources. Is it? Not a problem to just contact the Coastal Commission and say, hey, I'm worried about X. <laughs> well, I work with the staff at the Coastal Commission and lots of other agencies really closely. Um, 
And so, you know, you over time, you you build up credibility and, and relationships with people. And that's a lot of the work that environmental groups do is, you know, developing relationships and, you know, um, talking with staff to understand what the issues are and, um, you know, submitting public comments as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that is definitely a lot of the work that we do. And yeah, you can just call them up um, or email them. Are there ways in which we can support the work that you're doing, Jennifer? There are ways. You can always become a member or contribute, but um, another way is that you can get on our email list and speak out at public hearings when issues arise. I mean, the the more voices calling for protection of the bay and the coastal resources, the better. Um, and so we have uh, an email list. You can you can send us an email to alerts at humboldtbaykeeper.org. It's on our website, um, or you can um, you can email me as well. My contact information is on the web. Um, and you know, just following the issues. I mean, I. I do believe that um, local issues are where most people can get the most traction. And, you know, although, um, you know, the, the planet as a whole is faced with these very serious, um, you know, complex issues that are hard to get a handle on at the local level, um, you know, a lot of these issues that we deal with locally, uh, no one else is going to take care of them for us. We need to we need to speak up for protecting the bay and um, water quality, and we need your help for sure. Um, and one final question: Is the water quality of the bay overall getting better or worse? That's a good question. I don't know that um, there's really a way to generalize about that. It probably depends on which pollutant you're looking at. But I mean, I think I would I would say that depending on the time frame that you're you're talking about, it's getting better because there is less industry, there's less polluting industry. New development is required to have. Um, modern stormwater system. So instead of just letting the runoff, you know, get uh, get off your property as soon as possible into a pipe that diverts the water all into a creek, what new development does is um, create stormwater, they call them stormwater detention basins, so that the stormwater infiltrates into the ground slowly. And that way, those all that pollution isn't running off into the creeks and the ocean and the bay. And so that's a huge improvement. Um, and you know, if you think about the trajectory of uh, land uses around Humboldt Bay, we've gone from a point of doing a lot of heavy industry filling wetlands, um, you know, doing all kinds of damage to the environment to an era of a lot more restoration. A lot of the really big projects in, in the Humboldt Bay area are restoration projects. And um, so certainly since, you know, the last century, or I should say two centuries ago, the, the 19th century, the water quality has probably gone through some phases of getting worse and then, and then getting better. So I think we just don't have data on a lot of these things like the mercury in fish. We don't know what the source is and presumably coal-fired power plants around the world are the primary source, but we don't know of any local source for mercury. Uh, so we have no idea if that's getting better or getting worse. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough data. And unfortunately, a lot of the you know really big research grants are not being um, used in Humboldt Bay. They're being used in San Francisco Bay. So in California, that sort of, you know, much more populated areas. So there's a lot that needs to be studied here that isn't being studied. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jennifer, ever so much for a wonderful presentation and taking all our questions. We really appreciate everything you're doing and wish you well. And if you need support on something, feel free to let us know. 
Thank you, and we're delighted to have you come back if there's something major that you want us to address. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me, and thanks, everyone, for coming. And feel free to contact me if you have any other questions anytime. And we will be resuming. We are taking a break until September 19th, when we'll look forward to seeing you for our fall brown bag program. Thanks so much. Have a great time. Enjoy the classes this week. And if you want to sign up for the uh, camp, do it by tomorrow. And oh, and, and the word is that you need to sign up for camp classes by tomorrow, too, even if it's a half day or one day. So that's the deadline. And, and I guess they mean it. So mm -hmm. we hope to see you there. Bye, everybody. Alex, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, no, you gave a good closing statement there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. Bye, everybody. Take care. Have a good week. Bye. Have a great Thank time. Have much. a great day. Happy to summer, right? All right. <laughs>